Previously on Intersension Radio. You know, we've all experienced intuition. We've experienced in different ways, a gut feeling or sometimes in dreams. Uh, you know, intuitive dreams, dreams which, which turn out to be prophetic. Um, synchronicities, coincidences, these are all forms of intuition. We've all experienced them. And that's our intuition trying to guide us and trying to help us make the right choices. The real way to tell, to differentiate between what is a rational thought, a rational need, an intuitive thought or an intuitive um, hit, if you like, is that fear is never associated with intuition. Welcome to Intersension Radio. And welcome to Intersension Radio. I'm Chris McCleary, your host. And I'm excited about tonight because we have the one, the only, Kelly Lydic. Did I pronounce the last name correctly? <laughs> it's it's Lydic. Lydic. Oh, <laughs> crap. Okay. But That's okay. <laughs> this is going to be a treat. And remember, Intersension Radio is all about trying to achieve a state of inner peace. And we had on episode number one, we had um, Rat Owl from Reddit Dreams come on and teach us about the importance of sleep and dreams. So that meme continues. I'm not backing down from the importance of that. In fact, we're going to get into dream incubation and you're going to see how just how important it is from a personal side, but also a collective side. And it's been said before that uh, I think it was Robert Moss said it, that if we don't get back to our dreaming nature, we are going to die off. It's that mm -hmm. critical. So welcome, Kelly, to Intersension Radio. Hi, Chris. I'm so glad to chat with you tonight. How Thank does you it feel for... to be the first live interviewee on Intersension <laughs> Radio? It's really exciting. I love it. I love it. That's so, really great. You know, you, I'm looking at your bio and um, it, it almost looks like you're an Enneagram 3 because we have a meditation facilitator, a Reiki master, crystal Reiki master, past life healer, animal Reiki master, gateway dreaming coach, all these workshops. You have several uh, <clears throat> books, writing or, or uh, magazine articles and whatnot, and all these different associations. Give us a little flavor, Kelly, for where you came from um, and how you became you. Sure, sure. I appreciate you asking. So I, you know, I started my career um, in writing and publishing, actually. I went to college for creative writing and literature um, and realized that I also had an interest in spiritual topics. And then it was once I actually had a kind of a health crisis of my own that I really turned inward and started to make some changes in my personal life to facilitate healing and facilitate a regeneration of health. And in doing so, that really helped me to dig deeper into things like the past life healing and um, the gateway dreaming, namely. And so from there, um, by that time, I had also had gotten my master's degree in writing and consciousness, creative writing and consciousness. So really looking at, you know, the psychology of creative writing or the psychology of character and the psychology of readership and what it means to create works that are believable, you know, from a creative standpoint. Um, so with that in mind, what I did was I created a hybrid workshop called Writing the Dream Time. And that really took a deep look at how people can mine their dream content for creative work. And then from there, I think things just continued to unfold. And um, I just followed my interests and also, you know, the needs of my clients. I see clients one-on-one -on -one a lot. Um, I do teach workshops still, but the majority of my work is one-on-one -on -one work with clients. And so I'm facilitating for them, not just with their dream symbolism, but also real life strategies to implement so that they can, you know, live, live the life that they really desire. That sounds profound and to it, are dreams just a uh, segment of this or are dreams like the major portion of the, your work with the clients 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, primarily when I work with clients, I'm working specifically with dreams. We do use the incubation technique um, a, a lot, almost in every session, depending on what's happening with a client. And then um, from there, we actually build a script. I help the client build a script for the incubation process. And that is aimed at really looking at what Jung would call the shadow and how to open up some of the content of the shadow and bring it into consciousness so that we can stop, you know, catering to maybe a false belief or unconscious behavior or, um, you know, anything that, that someone really wants to change that's been a repetitive pattern of theirs. We can typically unlock that pretty quickly using the dreamscape and using the incubation process. Which we are really much, very much going to get into the whole dream incubation, the importance of it and how to do it and why we need mm -hmm. to do it but for now um the uh i was going to try and connect the past life into this or is that also channeled through the dreams or do you use other methods like hypnotherapy i'm not a hypnotherapist but i do i do sometimes look at dream content in the context of past lives and what sometimes comes up. I think I see that more often with people who are more adept dreamers or someone um, per se who's been using the incubation technique for a while. Um, that being said, it's usually because people have worked through some healing processes, um, have gained some conscious awareness through the incubation process, and then they're able to dig kind of a layer deeper as a consequence of that. So you do layered dream incubations then based on what you're seeing, um, say in this dream period, um, you learn a little bit from that, you get a few more patterns in there and then you start collecting incubations or start creating a, uh, well, like an affirmation, a request for another dream to explain yeah. something. Yeah, it's usually in the form of a question. Mm -hmm. An iterative process. I did that yes. in uh, my Master of Art in Transpersonal Studies with um, Henry Reed's method. And it was a 30-day iterative dream incubation. And mm -hmm. we started with a problem. Yep. And, you know, this vexing problem that you have. And basically, you have a series of dreams. And no matter what they are, you honor those and write them down, even though it doesn't seem like they have anything to do with your topic. <laughs> and right? you look for patterns <laughs> and you look for commonalities across the dreams and you interpret it in his specific method. And then from the results there, you do another week. It's basically four weeks worth and, uh, and it's iterative. So by the, by the time you end, you might have a whole different problem that you now realize it's more important than the problem that you started with, but you also have the solution. Right. So um, now when we get into your book, this um, latest mm -hmm. book is Dream Incubation for Greater Self-Awareness. It's a handbook. It's got chock full of um, information that it, you know, like, uh, what was it? Van um, Robert Van de Castle took um, like 400 pages to stuff in and uh you were somehow able to assimilate all that stuff into a shorter packet and that's why i love it it's a <laughs> nice quick summary of all the different um theories not all of the theories but several of the most important theories mm -hmm. uh, what was the inspiration behind this book yeah so things really i think i really wanted to think that was easy to read digestible quickly accessible um that didn't feel too, you know, academically cumbersome. I really wanted people to use it as a handbook as it's intended. It's also the counterpart to a Udemy course that I designed of the same name that folks can take um, and look at and listen to the lectures, the recorded lectures that I put together, um, which hew closely to the book, but not exactly, and use that process and learn the process so that they can start a practice or accelerate the current practice they have for dreams to really move forward with whatever challenge they're dealing with or whatever, um, I'll say, issue they want greater insight on, although it's not necessarily a negative thing. It could just be something that's not in awareness. So... Mm -hmm. 
the, the, the reason why I put it together is I really, again, wanted somebody to have it in their, in their hand on their computer, be able to use it and use it right away and start implementing it and, you know, do not pass go kind of things. I didn't want it to be cumbersome. Mm -hmm. What sorts of problems or, or what's, what sorts of reasons do we do dream incubation? What do you mm -hmm. teach? You know, it's interesting. I, when I see with my clients, I see all different kinds of things. But what I notice is that typically the incubation process is similar to what you're saying with your experience with um, Henry Reed, in that once we start doing the incubation process, it typically does reveal something that's deeper, you know, like peeling the layers of the onion, proverbially speaking. So when we start the incubation process, we may have one thing in mind and then we end up looking at something that's deeper. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what I found is that it actually leads people right to whatever it is that their core, kind of their core issue or their core characterology um, or the core um, for some, for the core wounding, we would say, right, mm -hmm. of their, their life and their character structure and their psychological makeup. So why, why it's exciting to me is because I feel like this process really zeroes in and gets to the heart of things quite quickly. Um, you know, I've seen people and, and heard of people that, you know, they spend 10 years maybe in therapy with a therapist um, and not that talk therapy is not necessarily effective, but when you can look at dreams and um, use the dreams, I'll say, as a way of coming at an issue from a very detached standpoint, I find that that accelerates the process because it's almost like when you look at dreams, there's one step removed, you know, you're, you're one step. The dreams are your dreams. Of course, they come from your psychology. They come from your emotional body. They come from past lives. That's true. But people have a tendency to look at dreams as something external to themselves. And so it's easier mm -hmm. from an emotional standpoint to analyze the symbols of the dreams and Kind of not take them so personally right and that i found is really what helps to accelerate the process because in talk therapy it's often a lot of emotional work um, uh, emotional expression and so there's there's quite a bit of um, attachment both mentally and emotionally to whatever issue is being discussed with the dreams it's kind of like holding it in an arm's length to be able to look at it from a 360 degree view without feeling um, emotionally triggered or upset with yourself or overly critical or, you know, and any of the things that come up when we're working on core issues, blame, shame, um, issues of worthiness or value, um, issues of confidence, all of the, the types of core things that you would see when someone is working through um, evolving their personality, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's exciting to me because I find that it is, it is so rapid. The results are rapid. I couldn't agree more. I, I actually did some, um, dream therapy. Well, I do, I actively do, do, do some dream therapy and I've noticed, uh, some like just an initial impression is that the stronger the dream. So like the more traumatic the dream or more traumatic, the experience, the quicker the, and bigger the insight and thus the bigger, um, change to life. And what I've noticed is that like you said, um, talking through to the subconscious, there's so many layers of filtration and protection, emotional protection. Hey, what does the therapist think of me? I feel right. judged. <laughs> I feel like I can't really say, but a lot of this is subconscious for a reason could because yeah. it's, it's better down there. The conscious doesn't want to know all this stuff. Well, dreams are naked in a way they're, they're exposing yeah. your subconscious. And um, in a brilliant way, a lot of times is these metaphors, you don't know exactly um, what they mean until you start working with someone to uh, kind of resolve the meanings of these things, but profoundly important and they work in metaphors very much mm -hmm. so. All okay. right. So uh, anyone who um, cites me in a book gets an automatic <laughs> cool points and gets to be on intersension radio. So I get, uh, I got cited in her book, which got me so excited that I got cited. And, um, <laughs> and it was about project August. Mm -hmm. You liked project August, correct? Is that why? Oh, I loved it. I thought it was so fascinating. And so, um, in terms of what you're saying, the, the collective, conscious or the collective unconscious therefore 
um, it was really revealing, you know? Sometimes I think that because we place ourselves often in the context of some of our um, predecessors, you know, in terms of like the psychological um, canon, I think that we forget about how dreams are actually tied to the modern world, you know? And I thought that Project August was such a really, really profound way to look at dreams and how dreams are really influencing not just the individual's daily life, but also as a collective, the things that we may not Mm -hmm. always talk about with another person, or we may not always see, or um, Mm -hmm. the things that are not obvious, you know, on a day-to-day basis, because we're going about our individual lives and, you know, everybody has a tendency to get caught up in whatever it is that's happening in the present moment, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, But sometimes it creates a little bit of a myopic view in terms of where we're placing ourselves as individuals within our larger community. And so that was, that was a huge reason why I thought it was so fascinating because Mm -hmm. it was a great, great reminder that we are also very connected even when we're not feeling connected or even when um, we're, you know, it's not obvious, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh That, um, for those of you who don't know, Project August was is a an example of collective dream incubation. And that's why I want to bring it up really quick now. I don't want to steal the thunder, but we're going to end up getting into um, individual dream incubation, which Kelly will, will highlight that part of it. But um, Project August was a collective effort, and we were going to see whether or not we can incubate dreams to predict the future. And it was in 2014. It was August of the target month. Target month was August 2014. So we started dreaming in April up to about July. And we published, I published predictive headlines for August. And um, we had two, let's see, 119 headlines and 101 of them came true. (laughs) And with an average accuracy of about four, four out of five. And so here's an example of four out of five was um, <clears throat> one actual um, predictive headline was um, a, an outbreak claims 1,200 lives in eastern Montana. And the actual headline and, you know, you got to you, you got to think if if all the dreamers are, are dreaming about an outbreak and it's around Montana, like, well, I mean, I have to I have to honor that. Like in April, it was, I think it was predicted in May. And by then Ebola was nowhere on the horizon. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody was talking about outbreaks. So I felt like I was create. this was just going to be crazy, stupid, but I went ahead and honored it. And I said that there's going to be 1200 people taken by an outbreak. And, uh, and so lo and behold, in August, the actual headline was Ebola claims 1200 lives. And it was in, but Sri Lanka, not Eastern Montana. So like the location was way off. That's why we got a decrement. But how the heck does the dreamers know that it's 1200 lives and an outbreak Two pinpoint accuracies? It was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And so details like that. And then you, you got some obvious other ones that, you know, sometimes you see the, the, um, the world or the predictive headline comes true, but the headline wasn't really all that precise. So like it might've come true in any year, but this one, there's no way that it, 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 you know, it's just too much of a coincidence. So, um, anyway, it wasn't a scientific study. It was more of a qualitative kind of study, but it was very exciting. I got to present that at the um, international association for the study of dreams. Um, so that is, oh, and the, the dream incubation process was, um, each person had the same statement that they would incubate the dream with. And they said, I will dream about the biggest headline happening in August of 2014. Everyone had to say that. And, uh, then they would go to sleep and then jot down the dream and, and, and put it up on the website. So that was the dream incubation so now that's pretty impressive with collective concern, but it's just as powerful, if not more on an individual basis. And that's how, that's why Kelly comes to us today to how do we get to inner peace through individual dream incubation? Yes. 
And that might be too it. big of a, of a, of a topic for me to drop that off to you. But <laughs> where do you want to start with dream incubation? Like how to I do think, it or why to do yeah. it? Kind of discuss yeah, I think that. we should tell people, you know, how, how to do the incubation process, which is really simple. Um, and I do think that there are some maybe personal variations of, of some of the minutia around it. But the way that I teach it and the way that I feel that it works well is, is quite simple. Essentially, you have your statement or your question, and it could be either or. Something like what you said, um, tonight I will dream about the biggest headline. That's more of a statement. Um, something that would be more of a question could be, um, you know, uh, what would be the best next step for my career? You know, broad question, but a question nevertheless. And I would have someone write that question or statement just on a small piece of paper and have some kind of container handy, a container with a lid specifically. Um, I like having the lid because I think it contains the energy of the question and the energy of the incubation process. And I typically tell people to put that container with that lid somewhere on their nightstand next to them on either side of the bed where they have a table. I also tell them never to put it on the ground because when we're dreaming, we want to be closer to the astral plane, not closer to the earth and grounded. We want to have access to the higher levels of self. So I would never place the incubation container anywhere on the ground. So now you have your container. Now you have your question. Does your it statement. matter if the container is metal or wood or, or cardboard? I think that this, the stronger, sturdier um, materials contain better just by consequence of, of their molecular structure, if we can think of it that way. Um, I don't ever recommend clear containers, plastic jar, you know, a glass jar, like a mason jar or something like that. I don't ever recommend something that's clear. I want something that's solid, that's contained, that, that has the lid, um, that feels sturdy and feels like a true container, not just something that's holding space and taking up space. And then before someone would retire at the end of the night, I would have them take that, that piece of paper, that question, and sit on the edge of the bed with feet not touching the ground and meditate on that question or that statement. Um, say it either aloud or to, you know, internally to the self three times and then place that piece of paper in the container, replace the lid, put the container back on, on the bedside shelf and then immediately retire to sleep. That's really the last thing that someone should do. Um, for instance, you wouldn't want to do the incubation or meditate on your question, then get up and go have a snack or brush your teeth or get a glass of water, do any of that. You want the incubation to be the very last thing that, that you do so that it's leaving an impression on your subconscious as you fall asleep. And then as, you know, as you're laying there and you have your eyes closed, it, you know, it could be good to, to meditate on it depending on the person. Some, for some, you know, if they are, if a person is good at non-attachment, I would say that they might not necessarily need to or want to continue to meditate on the question or statement. Um, but, you know, that would be a personal choice. And then retire to sleep, allow, you know, allow yourself to fall asleep naturally. And then once you wake up, journal whatever dream that you had. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I do use, with my clients, I do use a set of two questions. It's kind of a binary method that I use. And so what I do like to have people um, correlate is which question or statement is used once they receive a certain dream. So in other words, I want to know what, what was being incubated on so I can see the relationship between the question or the statement and the results that occur in the dream. Um, so for those folks, you know, who haven't used the, the incubation process, that would be a simplified, simplified way to do it. And then, you know, for those who may have tried it before, I think, again, some of the nuances might be, might be a cool thing to try, like the part about not keeping your feet on the ground as you're doing the incubation or the specifics with the container that I recommend may be different from what other folks have used in their own practice. So trying some of these nuances could um, change the results or, or increase or accelerate results as well. What do you think about um, like affirmations? I've heard some some people talk about it is a game of re reprogramming the subconscious since dreams are highly subconscious or mostly subconscious. 
is if you habituate anything. So for example, if I want to incubate a certain type of dream, you could maybe a predictive dream or maybe a problem dream. I can talk about that to myself all day long. To, I will dream about X, Y, Z. I will dream about X, Y, Z. So you're training your mind to dream about X, Y, Z. What do you think about that? I would say my answer is kind of twofold to that. I have very specific beliefs and very specific ways that I have clients um, implement affirmations. Hard-lined. You're hard very hard. <laughs> I am very hard line when it comes to affirmations because I feel like a lot. I feel like affirmations um, are often misused, and I feel like when an affirmation is misused, it can therefore therefore be ineffective and can actually bring about maybe the reverse or something mm -hmm. altogether different. Um, what I don't like to see people do is affirm something to try and trick their mind. And typically that's the way affirmations are used. In other words, if mm -hmm. your affirmation is making one statement all the way over here, but the actual state of your psyche is, is on the opposite side, there's not really a way to bridge that gap. And so what ends up happening is sort of a cognitive dissonance when the affirmation is not genuinely matched to the person's state of mind in the present moment. When you're, when you're kind of in the middle of that, you've kind of changed a little bit, but not all the way over. So mm -hmm. now you got both mm -hmm. extremes. Right, you know, right. And then us I humans think that... don't like cognitive dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> Holding two different ideas, we have to choose one or the other. Right, yeah. right. And so I don't, but I don't think it's useful. And I think that sometimes it can create setbacks or create um, with that cognitive dissonance, then you know, the mind with its monkey mind, right, has a tendency to spin off in other directions or create, you know, maybe a false belief may be created based on the mm -hmm. wrongful use of the affirmation because now the mind is trying to bridge that gap and it can't necessarily do it. And so it just fills in the blank any old way that it can. Um, so I've actually seen faulty beliefs be created when affirmations are not used to the present moment, if you will. Um, so I always use them very specifically. And I, I don't necessarily think that, um, you know, the, the hyped up term, you know, manifestation, right. It's kind of more of like a, like a spiritual buzzword lately, I think in the last handful of years. Um, I don't necessarily think that affirmations can create a manifestation per se. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. believe that. I believe more in synchronicity. I believe more in divine design. Mm -hmm. So that said, I think the second part of your question is, you know, can you incubate throughout the day essentially? And what happens when we are maybe consciously meditating, even if it's only peripherally throughout the day, I still mm -hmm. think that that will have an impact on the subconscious mind. Absolutely. So it would be like, um, it, I, I guess it wouldn't be any different than let's say watching the same commercial over and over 150 times somewhere that <laughs> the language or the jingle, right. It's going to be embedded in, in the subconscious mind. So I think that the affirmations or any kind of statement that, we, that you would use as a mantra uh, over and over, will be embedded somehow in the subconscious. So it's really just a matter of, can we bridge the gap between the subconscious mind and what's happening in the present moment and how, how far or how close are those two um, statements or realities or perceptions in order to then utilize that to, to move forward or to make conscious choice to move forward in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, I think fullness and the use of it and having a clear picture of that, what's happening in the present moment. And then um, I think it's about using, using affirmations in a mindful way, right? So that we okay. can use the affirmation to meet the present moment. And then from that present moment, then go forward um, without getting bogged down, I guess, um, in that cognitive dissonance or in a faulty belief or something that's not emotionally resonant, but you're trying to trick your mind to, to heal your emotions or any other number of ways that the affirmations can be used. Mm -hmm. Now back to the uh, container. Um, I was thinking along the lines of if, you know, if a listener is not buying into this idea about the container, I can see that um, 
the importance there, even if we're wrong on the energy side of things and the encapsulation of it or kind of the protection of it, even if we're wrong about all that, to the subconscious, to put it into a chest or a kind of a valued place, makes the importance of it go up. And Mm -hmm. when the importance goes up, then it kind of rings some bells in the subconscious to manifest some sort of dream along those lines. Do you agree with that? I do. And I also, at the same time, I also think of things kind of on a quantum level, right? We Mm. know um, that when we think about the molecular structure of, let's say, um, oak, oak wood, um, we know that it's very dense material because the wood is very hard, right? If you were knocking on the door, (laughs) um, which means that those molecules are really, really tight knit. Um, Something like plastic per se is not really, because it's not natural, it's a, it's a manufactured petroleum product. It doesn't really breathe. It's not mm-hmm. an oxygenated kind of thing. It doesn't have, although, it, although carbon is at its base, um, I think on a vibrational level, it's like, a, it's like a dead material, you know, it's like it's not breathing. Whereas something like an oak wood, small container or chest has a tendency to, to retain its, its living energetic imprint. And so I tend to think of it that way. Okay. Um, and maybe that's a little bit too esoteric. Well, um, I can go even esoteric <laughs> on you beyond this. And uh, in the law of one material, which I, I think I might do an episode on the law of one, but um, mm. or maybe have a guest on to discuss it some more, but they talk about the power of a pyramid. And I'm looking mm. at this container going, if we really want stronger energy yeah. consolidated on that particular topic, then we would do a four-sided pyramid. It can't be metal. You know, they yeah. talk about the materials that they can make their pyramids in, but it goes translates directly over to um, Egypt and the Egyptian pyramids and where they placed their mm, their rooms, the king's room, the queen's room, all that are placed specifically for maximum. And one of them was healing. And then the other one was maximum like transcendence or spiritual growth and that kind of thing, or connection right. to this other side or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that one would be, well, it could be either closed or open. It, they said it doesn't really matter. And it increases the, like, so for example, um, like, some sort of plant, if you put it into a pyramid, right. would grow bigger. It's all right. theoretical. But according to them, it's real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Now, lucid dreaming. Do you, oh, uh, do you go into lucid dreaming at all? How does that work into your dream incubation? And this is kind of paradoxical because lucid dreaming, for those of you who are new to lucid dreaming, is when you know that you're in the dream as you're dreaming. And so if you're incubating a dream, um, it, it, it kind of sounds counterintuitive. Why don't you just go into the dream and create that which you want? Well, there's different levels of lucidity. Anyway, I'll let you kind of go with the lucid dreaming idea and see what we come up with there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think I touch on it just briefly in the book, but the book doesn't really give a how-to on Mm-hmm. Um, incubating specifically to invoke the lucid state. Um, really more of my approach is about mining the subconscious and mining the shadow to bring that content to light. And so the greater self-awareness piece is really coming from the standpoint of looking at the shadow and, and drawing that material out. But I do think that if one were to incubate specifically for a lucid dream, to experience the lucid dream, I think that's absolutely totally possible. And I have had some people report that that's what they want to do. Um, I think what you're saying is true in terms of, you know, what are the levels of lucid dreaming and, you know, is it just a matter of having control of your dreams? Is it um, looking into and experiencing, you know, another dimension per se or um, I know Robert Moss, another another gentleman who I cited in my book, he often talks about um, the dream state being a reflection of a parallel life, right? Um, I love that. Yeah, coming from the standpoint that there is no time, that everything is happening simultaneously, the dream is actually uh, a life that's happening in another dimension. So I think that we absolutely can incubate 
to have those experiences. And, and I think breaking beyond or breaking through the paradox comes in when you hit that hypnagogic state and you are going into detachment. So it's kind of like um, doing the incubation process and then letting it go and just letting whatever is going to happen, happen. Um, and then once the, you get to the point of lucidity, then you're lucid and then you're um, kind of co-creating in the moment of the dream. So or I think hopefully. It, it, there's nothing that um, is more frustrating than becoming lucid, but not being able to do anything about it. <laughs> right. I know a few people, a couple of my clients were very astute, uh, lucid dreamers until the shadow figure shows up and then they're uh -huh. helpless and they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they can fly anywhere they want, do it, create anything they want until the shadow guy shows up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would think that part of that is because the shadow is, is sort of that anchor into, you know, the current body, current psyche, current moment of time. Something very um, dark in that, um, space of subconscious material. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of pull, pulls you back in. Mm -hmm. It's a self-sabotage mechanism. Can be. Now, some, some people would say it's more like a higher self or soul based wall that, you know, you need to, for some reason, experience this shadow guy or this scary situation or this particular problem that you can't solve or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for some sort of soul growth. What do you think about that? I think that that can be true. Um, you know, I think when we come from a place of optimism and can look at really anything, no matter what it is, no matter what, what the challenge is, as an opportunity to evolve, you know, I think that can be totally possible, really in any context, whether it's waking or dreaming. Um, and sometimes it's hard, you know, depending on the challenge or what, whatever it is, you know, that, that someone is facing, sometimes it's hard to always be in that, in that space of um, accepting the experience as an opportunity for growth. You know, it's, it's easy to, to um, either self-sabotage or go into kind of a why me or a victim mentality or a misunderstanding, right? Because if we look at, the divine order or the metaphysical versus the physical, they're not often, they don't often appear to be aligned. Now, how often do <coughs> you have to work through frustration where you're incubating a certain type of dream or a problem, a solution to the problem, and then something bizarre comes in and maybe night after night, you're trying to get this dream. How do you handle that frustration level that you're, Hey, you're not getting what you want, or maybe you don't get any dreams. I work with, well, I work personally with the incubation process. And, in, um, like I said, at Atlantic university and I did just that. And my answer would have been, if I was asked to this, this question, if you're getting constantly different dreams than your, what you're wanting, they, they, they seem to be, um, stupid. They seem to be nothing of what you asked for. I'm still writing it down. And here's one of the answers is that um, if you look at the dream as stupid, then you'll just keep getting more stupid dreams and you're not going to be getting the solutions that you wanted, that you're asking for. That's number one is to, no matter what you get, honor it by writing it down, by um, really curiously investigating it and acting like it's a really valuable dream. And guess what? It probably is a really important dream. It's just that it looks stupid on the outside or it's just, that's just your perception. So don't look the, at the dreams as stupid. Um, and then the next one is, uh, I lost my train of thought. Are you back yet? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, no problem. It's still kind of choked up there. I know I'm just getting over a little bit of a cold too. And sometimes you just get that little bit of a tickle on the back of your throat. Um, one more thing is um, looking <clears throat> for in these various dreams, just keep waiting, keep enduring, keep writing down your dream. And over time, you'll see a pattern developing. And it's probably going to be a metaphor. You're not going to see you know, red shirt, red shirt, red shirt, red shirt. You'll see something else that, it, um, that's metaphoric, but is the same topic 
particularly in emotion, you'll see a patterned emotion coming up in all the dreams, whether or not it's you as the character or maybe the other person is angry, but maybe anger is across the board. Well, there, that's very significant. Always look for the emotional content underneath. All right, Kelly. I agree. Your turn. No, I agree. I can agree completely. And what I was going to say is that whenever um, I have someone who's coming up against, I, I call it an ebb and flow, right? When they're kind of in the ebb and they're not, the dreams are not seeming to flow. I always just say, don't get attached to it. Go into that space of non-attachment and just let the space open up. You know, I think if we try and overanalyze it too much or start to become critical or, um, trying to incubate over and over and over the same question. There's a reason why there's, you know, there's maybe a dry spell or the dream doesn't seem to make sense. But again, continuing what you said, continuing to write it down, um, continuing to look at the symbols, continuing to even incubate through, you know, a period of, of having no dreams will reveal a pattern, as you say. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is to look at the question that you're asking. And there's possibly the question is just too broad, too open, or it, the question itself might have a metaphor in it that the dream or the subconscious can't really work out because, you know, I don't have a quick example, but, um, I don't know, you know, some, some word that you're using means two different things. And maybe that's why you're getting bizarre dreams is because it's not clear to the subconscious what it is you're asking for. So right. maybe rephrase the question for the next one. Yep. I agree with that as well. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you were saying in terms of an iterative process. And so when I work with clients, I always do, um, a, I do it in kind of a binary way. I, I prompt them with specific language for two different questions. And one question is actually geared specifically for the subconscious mind. And then the other question is actually geared towards the conscious mind. So in a coaching session, let's say when we're talking about a dream and we're working through the symbolism and we're uncovering either the emotional pattern, like you mentioned, or um, kind of an underlying current or a theme. Now that theme or that emotional piece is known, it's more known in the conscious mind. And so the subconscious question would be intended to dig a little bit deeper into uncovering more about what was revealed. And then the conscious question would be looking at um, furthering it from the conscious state, almost like you would do, you know, during waking time, but still inquiring through the dream. And so it's kind of like coming at the theme or the issue or um, the process from, from both, you know, both sides of the coin so that there's a higher incidence, I think, of getting the answer that you want or getting an appropriate answer to the question it may not be what you want, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it may be, you know, an answer, which is really what people want. They're seeking resolution to something. In all this work with helping people incubate dreams, is there one thing that across the board just really accelerates people's um, satisfaction levels or, you know, getting the solution that they wanted? You know, one or two things that really expedite this process if someone is doing it on their own i think a couple different things um making sure again going back to the feet not being on the ground as they incubate okay. i think that's one um i've seen people drink a half a glass of water right before they incubate something about the fluidity of the water right because as we drink water it assimilates into our body which is mostly made of water and I think it also just it stirs the digestion process as we sleep. So there's something to that. Um, <clears throat> I also think it's about, you know, framing or phrasing the question in, in the right way and working with, as you say, a question that's not too broad, but something that can encompass the intention for, for resolution or for awareness. And so, uh, those I think are the th probably the three top things I would say are the three key things. How often are you incubating for your own life? Are you doing it weekly or maybe just monthly? I do it probably a couple times a week, maybe twice a week. I think once, once a person gets into a routine with their dream practice, um, 
you know, when I'm working actively with clients, I typically tell them to incubate every single night. Um, and if they don't get a dream, that's fine. Just go to the next night. And since it's a, since I work with them in kind of a binary way, I also allow them to use the questions however they see fit. So um, the, the time frame between sessions would be two weeks. So a person could use one question for one week and the other question for the other week, or if they wanted to do alternating, you know, one day, one question, one day, the other, and just go back and forth. Um, so when we're actively working on something and using that information to catalyze or transform in the waking life, I, I always say do it every day, regardless of whether you're your dream. And then if it seems like you're really coming up against some kind of a dry dry point, dry spell, or, or you're not getting any dreams, then pause, put the incubation down, and then come back to it when it feels right to the person. Um, mm -hmm. Once you've kind of established, I think that routine or that pattern, I think it's not necessarily the, um, needed to do it every day, but someone could do it a couple times a week and still have the same kind of resolution. Because in a way, you're kind of syncing up your conscious and your subconscious mind to mm -hmm. work together to um, be, be present in the present moment, right? So um, in that way, I think a flow really is established when a person is practicing the incubation technique over longer periods of time, months, you know, three, four, six months or longer mm -hmm. and incorporating it into their practice it's that way. directly related to the uh, information that um, Rat Owl had in the first episode is... Um, becoming one, becoming reconnected, but your dreams are telling you what, where the conflict is. And you mentioned it. It was yeah. the uh, conflict between unconscious and conscious mind. Making that connection is required for inner peace. And in yeah. order to get there, we do have to tap into the subconscious. And the great greatest biohack known to man is that <laughs> dream process Dreams. or for the subconscious mind. And then mm -hmm. obviously the conscious mind, we should be pretty good at mindfulness mm -hmm. and meditation can improve that but it's mm -hmm. all about the dreams it's a vast sea of unconscious material yes. all right this book um, yes. by kelly dream incubation for greater self-awareness and in there you're going to get uh, tips for rapid results how to set the intentions you're going to get the subconscious mind the conscious mind a history of dream practices brain activity during the sleep you're going to get a lot of material and where do they find this book kelly it's um this book is actually only available in digital form so you can purchase it on amazon if you have a kindle or you can purchase a pdf download from my website which is just my name www.kellylydick.com all right. And we will have in the final show notes, we'll have those links available and we'll have the preview of the book at intersention.com radio and Kelly will get the proceeds, but we'll also get a little cut. It's not any more to the customer, but it helps both of us out. And, um, and then where do they go to get some dream help? And, you know, is that the same website? Yep. Um, people can just navigate to my website. I do have a contact form. Um, if someone wants to email me directly, it's just Kelly at kellylydic.com. And I'm happy to answer, you know, further questions about the coaching process and demystify that a little bit. Um, I always say it's not for the faint of heart. So person has to be ready to do the work if they want to dig in. Now, what about this, um, Udeme, is that how you pronounce it or Udemy? Uh, the, uh, academic thing that you did? I call it Udemy. I'm, I'm Udemy. not sure. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I call it Udemy. I don't know. So um, is it's that still active? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where mm -hmm. do they find you there? Yes. So if you go to Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y.com. And actually, this is, this is really cool, too. If you sign up for the course, you actually will get the book as a bonus. So if you take the course, you'll be able to download um, a PDF of the book from your course um, dashboard <clears throat> and it's just the same title the course is the same title as a book okay cool and we'll have that in the show notes as well um i'm wondering if we could do a periodic dream incubation process on the mm -hmm. radio show and i'm i'm thinking about how that'll work we have 
Why we're going to have um, Dr. Diane okay. Dreher periodically on for short periods of yin yang and Tao talk, and mm. so we might be able to do something like dream incubation with that process as well. Great. We can incubate how the collective is doing, just like we did in uh, Project August. Now I'm thinking like an Aquarian. <laughs> All right, Kelly. It was a pure pleasure to have you on the show, especially live. And um, thanks for remembering the mute button. <laughs> that was good of you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah. We were able to roll with it. We had a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, good. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and really appreciate um, your insight and your perspective. Um, and it's just really great. Really, really fun. I always enjoy these talks. Dreams are vast and we're going to have much more dreams on Intersension Radio. So just hang on. And Kelly, thanks again. And we'll look forward to the next discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs> Intersension Radio.